We're proud to announce CISO Stories, a new podcast series in partnership with Cybersecurity Collaborative and Cyber Reason. CISO Stories features the candid perspectives and experiences of frontline senior security executives and dives deep into timely security topics. CISO Stories is hosted by Todd Fitzgerald, VP of Cybersecurity Strategy at Cybersecurity Collaborative, and Sam Curry, Chief Product and Security Officer at Cyber Reason. Listen weekly as they speak with extraordinary CISOs by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CSP. Hey, welcome back to Security and Compliance Weekly. Hey, in case you haven't heard, InfoSec World 2021 has, I think this is official, tell me in my ear, it's switched to a virtual event. They are proud to announce their keynote lineup though, and it's going to be topped off by, let's see if I can get it right this time, Robert Herjavec. Plus, yes. heads of security yes. at the NFL, yes. TikTok, U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Someday we'll say the names of all these people. Stanford University and more. And if you uh, want to take advantage of it, Security Weekly listeners can save 20% off the World Pass and Main Conference registration. How do you get this? You go to securityweekly.com forward slash ISW2021 and register now. And of course, while you're on our website, if you want to catch up on any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, you can find them uh, at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. All right, uh, let's get back into this discussion where we were at the end of the first uh, uh, part trying to figure out whether hacktivism, whether we mean this is a good thing or a bad thing, and we we're trying to discuss it based in the context of Edward Snowden. Um, so I think to frame this, uh, or, or at least my view on it, is I, I think whether you view what someone's activities are that involve some sort of uh, hacking or doing something with the technology, uh whether we consider it uh, hacktivism or not is one issue, and whether we consider it to be uh, good or bad is another issue. But I think that depends on your perspective. I will throw this out there. Uh, Joe, uh, who is wearing the notorious uh, RBG shirt, so we probably have a clue where you're coming from. Um, I'm a former <laughs> DOD employee that worked Uh, as a civilian employee for a certain three-letter agency that may or may not be uh, a key part of the whole Snowden thing. I can speak for uh, many of my colleagues whom I still associate with, um, and and myself, frankly, that have a a fairly low opinion on what Snowden did. Uh, I, I can speak for myself because of knowing how much, uh, time and money and resources go into uh, cultivating resources in that business, uh, which he sort of gave over. Uh, the fact that he compromised uh, secrets like that, that, that uh, you know, cost a lot to, you know, aren't easy to replace resources and, and ultimately uh, probably got some people killed. So there was a cost in terms of human life to what he did, regardless of what his motivations were. I believe in what he was motivated to try to, to, to pry, try to bring light to to whistleblow on. I just think he went about, you know, there was other ways he could have uh, raised the issue without doing what he did. So I would fall into the category of saying that what he did was bad. Uh, I'll I'll drop it there and 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 I don't hold anybody against any anybody's uh, opinion against anybody for whatever that is. So please, let's discuss. Yeah. So if that's if that's to me, I mean, I would absolutely say when you get into loss of life, <laughs> a threat to na- you're laughing, a threat to national security. I mean, it's not just okay. We spent a significant amount of money developing this technology that's now moved out into the public realm. All right, that, right. that's one thing, and I'll, I'll put that in a box, and maybe we can open it later. But the threat and the loss of life. Again, the national security interest that was compromised, that to me, I agree. I absolutely agree with you. We move now into, you know, this was this was extremely bad. And I think the way that it was executed was poor. I understand that his motivation and his, again, his social beliefs, his 
his attraction to look, this is wrong. And I need to be the whistleblower to make sure that I shed some light onto these things that are going on that people really aren't aware of. I, I appreciate that. But the way that he went about it was just so poor. And what ended up snowballing from there was really just so unfortunate. And it had tremendous effects. I think what happens you know, the the trigger, the snowball, the butterfly effect of that later, I think ended up having some good impact again, on society. It also is a very double-edged sword. But he, for me, moved into that, you know, bad camp when it did have that loss of life and threat to, to security. So I'll, that's so, that's just my perspective, but I will leave that to the rest of you too. No, so I, either I, way I think it's, it, it's really a difficult Rubik's to make a top. hard and fast call on it. Hold um, on. Yep, flee first and then Scott. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I think it's really difficult to make a hard and fast call on it. Um, for the D&D nerds out there, this is part of the reason why it's always difficult to have a chaotic good person in your party, um, because somebody doesn't always think through the consequences of their actions. One of the things that I, I would take exception with, though, is, you know, we, we've been talking about, hey, the impact of Snowden from a loss of life standpoint, which definitely is, you know, significant and tragic. But we are focused on loss of life of American citizens, or at least the ones that we think are good American citizens. When in actuality, we know that some of the things that Snowden was exposing were tools and techniques that were being utilized to facilitate the loss of life of other citizens, whether or not they were a U.S. citizen or maybe an activist or, you know, somebody in the U.S. that we weren't particularly happy with or for that you may be somebody outside the United States. So I think on either side of the equation from what Snowden's activities were, there was some kind of loss of life. Had he kept his mouth shut? Yep, that would help facilitate continued loss of life out in the field. Um, by him actually saying things, then obviously that also, you know, probably led to loss of life of U.S. agents. So I think it's actually a much grayer area. And, and I don't know if, uh, at least for me personally, I don't feel comfortable saying that an American's life is worth more than an Israeli's life or, uh, you know, somebody in the U.K.'s Ab life. And these were all absolutely, you know, impacted parties. Um, yep. so, so, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I guess I am going to be the obnoxious person. I still think we need these chaotic good people in the ecosystem. I do think that Snowden overall, the impact was positive. How he went about it, though, yeah, de definitely short-sighted. But um, I, even me saying I'm speculating at that point when I say that it's short-sighted, because he may have also been aware that his actions were going to lead to a loss of life. But overall, maybe he believed that the loss of life that his, that his actions would lead, lead to was going to be smaller than the loss of life had he not said something. Yeah, maybe he believed that he was still contributing to the greater good because it was that incremental impact was still not as large as the impact he would have overall and you know, over his lifetime. So I, I agree with you. And the, that loss of life, yeah, it, it is global. I mean, there, there's an impact everywhere, not just to us, you know, for national security purposes. So completely agree. And I can't, you can't put a price tag on that or a value. One life is is definitely not, you know, more valuable than another. So I, yeah, I absolutely agree. But I don't think I was supposed to comment there. So sorry. Nope. You're absolutely allowed to comment whenever <laughs> you want, if you can get a word in. Uh, Scott, mm -hmm. you were next. No, I was I was simply saying that, you know, trying to un un you know, take a look at all of this is sort of like flipping the Rubik's Cube a couple dozen times and seeing what you get and then flipping it again and seeing what you get. You know, there really is no one set answer on how to deal with something like this. Um it, was the US government in the right? Don't know. Was Snowden in the right? Don't know. He believed he was in the right, and that's what a lot of the that's where a lot of the judgment has been placed. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, guys. Well, I'll I'll say this, and and uh, I'm saying this in all seriousness. Not that I'm ever not serious. Um, one of the issues I, I think at hand in, in terms of the Snowden case in general was, um, you know, uh, well, twofold. One is again, you know, what he had concerns about, and 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 how he went about doing it, but. Um, what came out of it shortly after it happened and what I was hearing in uh, our little echo chamber of the hacker security community was a lot of things being said about how NSA, oh, I said the three letters, NSA was being blatantly the puzzle doing palace. things illegal, had run amok, was was flagrantly violating the law, you know, moral, ethical, legal, and all that kind of stuff. And my my take on all that was like, hmm, I've actually worked there. I've actually 
gotten in trouble for doing things similar but different to what Snowden was pointing out. Um, and and it, it was the one of the reasons why I gave a talk several years ago about my personal experience getting caught, you know, getting in trouble at NSA, but trying to make the point, look, if you're going to object to what Snowden is objecting to, that's one thing. If you're going to accuse an agency of doing flagrantly illegal things, let me just give you some more insight. Let me give you another side of the story, not to change your mind, but just to give you some more insight. In my experience working for that particular agency, I, I found it to be, and I believe it continues to be, uh, a very conservative, bureaucratic, politically oriented uh, or type of organization where they're they're not very quickly going to do things that are on the edge or or might be borderline over the edge. They 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 historically have tried to stay uh, very much within the lines, and and there there are lines that are drawn for them. What was it questioned though, which I think is legitimate, that Snowden pointed out was. Uh, are the lines that have been redrawn largely because of 9-11 and the Patriot Act and all its various permutations, are the lines that have been redrawn for this intelligence agency and others in the right place? Or has we have a, as a country sort of overstepped our bounds and that's being, uh, you know, demonstrably seen by these particular agencies doing what they're doing? <laughs> Um, that's a very fancy, convoluted way of saying: Should you know? Should the government be wiretapping and eavesdropping on U.S. citizens because of the threat of of terrorism and possible loss of life? Which is really what it boils down to. Not trying to change anybody's mind. That I just want to give that additional color commentary. Um, Joe, what I heard you say though, to just try to back this up a little bit and 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 make it more of a. Uh, you know, theoretical discussion. You 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 said a word that I think is an important indicator on how we see all this, and and I want you to comment on it. You mentioned the word motivation. Uh, could you just unpack that a little bit? Sure. I mean, I, I I think it really depends on the motivation of the actor. I mean, I think Flea was just talking about you know that that chaos for good, or. Mm -hmm. You know that actor that is the disruptor but really it is for good and is the agent of change that causes it is good motivation on behalf of the organization to promote a positive change i, I think right. that can absolutely favorably help an organization favorably help a governmental organization i mean take your pick but i think when that motivation starts to turn and you know this is the example that you gave before i mean when we really get sideways and go to the all right well i'm financially motivated i'm angry i'm disgruntled i'm disenfranchised i'm disenchanted you, I, i'm out of i'm in misalignment with my personal values to the company's values you know, now i've moved into a different camp of I, I am a threat to the organization i'm a threat because again i want to be on any one of those spectrums when that motivation changes then, I mean, that's a significant risk to the organization. And how much of that risk depends on how great the motivation, what access they have, you know, what they're motivated to act against. So all of those things, you know, have a, have a great impact on, again, the organization and, and how that person is motivated to act. So how does the organization realize that you have people that are either colluding or, you know, acting by themselves and then identify those people, those individuals, and remove them to protect the organization? I think one of the one of the biggest things that, you know, we've always tried to talk to our clients about is really this is, it is about people. Your organization should still be focused on all of those individuals and taking a look at them, not just from, you know, what they're achieving from their, you know, traditional operational milestones, but how are they? I mean, I think if anything, the last 18 months have proven that somebody who is really struggling, somebody who's having mental health issues, somebody who is, again, starting to get disenfranchised for what the organization is doing or out of alignment will act very maliciously. And if they're acting and nobody is checking in on them, nobody from an HR standpoint is connecting with employees, is looking at what that risk factor is, that's a huge risk to the company. So, I mean, building that in on the front end with hiring, making sure you know, your employees know, your potential candidates know, this is what we stand for. This is what we do. We value our people. We're going to continue to check in. I mean, at least on the outset, you you try to weed out people that 
don't have those aligned values. When you get down to it and they're they're in the organization, you've got to continue to check on the pulse and the culture of the company. I mean, how and the bigger the organization, the harder that is. But they should be paying attention to those people. How are they acting? Are they seeing trends? And we could go into you know data analytics and predictive analytics to try to see how they're acting when it comes you know way down to a tech standpoint, which they should be doing too. But how are the people in your organization? How are they acting? How are they responding? What are they doing? What do they have access to again? So when you start to think about that and tie it together, it's your responsibility as an employer to pay attention to those signs and to be proactive about it, not wait for the incident to occur. What, I, what I'm hearing you say, Joe, is there isn't just another security product to go out there and drop in and that'll take <laughs> care of all this. Uh, so I'm, I, I, I can speak for most of our community and say I, I'm at a loss at what to do. Because <laughs> you really like to just drop the product in? <laughs> well, yes, there are quite a few uh, organizations out there that they, th- they th- that think that the solution is simply buy yet another blinky box and, and then everything is hunky-dory from a security and compliance perspective. Um, yeah, and we hear that a lot. Hey, I bought this shiny fun thing. It's supposed to fix this thing. And we'll typically say, yeah, that, that thing is fun and shiny. It actually doesn't do any of the things that you thought that it did or that you <laughs> bought it for. We can put it in for these functions, but now can we solve this other problem? So yeah, I mean, right. we can buy some fun, shiny stuff, but it still goes down to, are you config- have you configured the stuff that you already have? If you really need something, yeah, we'll put it in. But do you have the policies, the procedures, the internal controls, the right, you know, organizational framework and culture to make sure that you're paying attention to those signs. You can look at them with analytics all day, but you still have to have the front end to make sure that we're getting the threats out before they start to pop up on a radar in a, in a SOC. You know, I was going to step in and say that we see a lot of C-level execs, especially in the tech industry, starting to put money towards technology versus actually buying people and building process right, or purchasing people or putting capital towards people, however you want to quantify it, and you just hit the nail right on the head. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is one that we caution them on routinely. I get it, we can buy some more stuff. And I know that you're just now getting into the world of cyber because somebody else said it was important, you saw it in Congress, but however now you feel personally responsible to the organization, that's great, welcome to the party. We've been doing this for decades. But now that you're here, yeah, let's not buy some more product. I mean, you still have to protect your assets, pay attention to your people who have access to the assets, digital assets, physical assets, so that they're you're controlling that. And again, especially when it comes to the high value information assets, where are you making your money? Are you protecting it and the people that have access to it? And if the answer is no, yeah, I can put some more tools in. It's still not going to fix the original problem. They're they're still shitting the bed from a security standpoint. Pardon me. <laughs> You're allowed to curse. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Did we mention we drink on this show? Except for I'm not today because I'm driving later. Um, <laughs> right. And you didn't mention PCI. Well, I, I, was, getting, I was getting ready to. <laughs> All right. We, <laughs> we have been a long way. Like it's been almost an hour and we he's have. just now throwing PCI. <laughs> yes. yep. And I didn't even get to say it first. They, they all like to rob me of the pleasure. Um, <laughs> Well, and I was going to speak just a tad more generically from a compliance perspective. But when I say compliance, I'm really talking about PCI. Um, and and ask you, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, for the companies that approach uh, security more from a compliance perspective, what are some of the things that they can do or maybe could do better or maybe with a little bit more focus that might help them uh, address the potential problem of they have insiders that go off the rails in some of the ways that we've been talking about. And I think from an identity standpoint, really, again, paying attention to who has access to what. I mean, your your organization is really brokering at, at this point. This is where digital meets physical and how critical those things are. I mean, mm-hmm. managing the access to those assets is really important. So, you know, making sure that and this is everyone, you know, not just internal employees. There's an entire population of third parties that for some reason nobody yep. pays attention to. And we could go breach after breach to talk about why third parties are just as you know critical for you to maintain. But right. people having access to those assets, how are you managing that? And how are you, again, removing it, which is we like to giveth, we forget to taketh away. 
So who's managing the <laughs> removal of that access, the termination of employees, the recycling of these IDs that have no, you know, they have infinite dates. I've got 1231, you know, 9999. Nobody's got a password change. It's been accounts that have just rotated among, you know, 15 contractors. No, well, paying attention to You're totally forgetting to that. service accounts. Come on, service yes, accounts. Yes, sir. Oh, my God. With the, <laughs> yes. No. Why with the service accounts? You're killing me. Yeah, just providing that access like candy, not recertifying and not looking at it, not not having an automated way to continue to, again, routinely look at how we're provisioning and deprovisioning that. I mean, I feel like this is blocking and tackling. We shouldn't still be talking about this, but we absolutely are. They don't want to invest in that, but it's completely pervasive and can eliminate a lot of this and very quickly stop a threat if you recognize the signs early. So, I agree, I mean, you're, you're, by the way. And everything you described are PCI requirements if you would just simply apply them and, and think of them in that manner. Um, go ahead. I'm just sorry, saying. Josh. Go ahead. Just well, no, I mean, it's it's an interesting point you raise about the, you know, just along, you've brought this back to identity and access management and how we make it easy for activists, well, really hacktivists, because activists are just out there talking. That's fine. Honestly, I mean, in a sense, it's free speech, and I'm a big proponent of free speech. But uh, <clears throat> if, if you're talking about the ability of people to, to perform hacktivism, and you've brought this back to identity and access management, and it's, it's fascinating that, yeah, we, we suck at this. <laughs> it's really yeah, we, we really suck. Like uh, on a company to company, it doesn't matter if you're small, medium or large. We globally kind of suck at this, which is ridiculous. And so, yeah, but I, I mean, in your access management is only one big piece of the picture, and it all goes towards the basics of information security. Right or worse, it's one little piece, and we still don't get it right. Yep, uh, it's it's. I think it's a big piece. I think like uh, like Joe, like you said, it's blocking and tackling. These are table stakes. These are the mm -hmm. fundamentals. You know, we'll use whatever phrase floats your boat. But um, you know, it's <laughs> it's it's it really is. If you don't do this, you're really not doing compliance and security well. Sorry, try again. Yeah, and you, it, you would be, well, you guys won't be, but most people would be shocked at how many conversations we enter into either a boardroom or C-levels or senior management, you name it, where that is a shock. That no, you're not even meeting the minimum table stakes. You, you're really oh, not. Oh, no, totally, totally get that. And I, and I mean, I know people are like, well, what is the table stakes? And I go, well, are you doing change management, config management, you know, uh, 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 asset management, identity management? Uh, are you doing those things? And they're like, uh, I think so. Like no, we bought a tool for the thing and, you know, our cousin put it in and it was supposed to be working, but I don't, was there more than that? We've got I a whole room a full of boxes too. with blinky lights. It's really pretty. It's like oh a oh my God. Into <laughs> cyber insurance a lot. You know, uh, we've seen it where it's a million dollar policy for, do you own a firewall? Not, is it plugged in? Is it configured? Are you pulling logs? Just do you own a firewall? You know, it could be on the shelf. So it, it's, it's not that uncommon. I literally okay, had a conversation this morning with somebody on a different Discord where they were like, yeah, my, my company's WordPress got hacked. And it's like, okay, uh, what are you doing about it? He's like, well, I don't know what to do. I'm a, I'm a sysadmin. I'm like, okay, you need to bring a professional consulting company in to help you fix this. Or, you know, if it's your Is company, like they need to... Is that like a cis white male, a cis ad admin? Oh, or... <laughs> oh, here we go. Now we need to put on the waiters because it's getting thick. <laughs> Oh my God. All right, wait. I want to go back to wow. insurance for two seconds. I got to go back to insurance. Why? So, Why? Oh, God. No. <laughs> yes, come back to insurance. Right. Yes, come on back. No, come no, no. I'm coming side. back to insurance. This is all you. I'm doing it. Bite. So <laughs> help me understand how the million dollar policy. All right, again, we talked about shitting the bed. Okay, if uh -huh. I bring a server down, if I have any kind of incident, so there's an accidental oops, sorry, oh, we are way more than a million dollars. Please help me understand what that million dollar policy from insurance, cyber insurance standpoint, is going to do to help the organization. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you the official answer. Mailers, you know, for they pay notification. <laughs> Flea, go ahead. Uh, take take, the, take <laughs> the official side. What what officially is it supposed to do? Oh, no. no. Well, I mean, I feel like we basically think about some of these smaller policies. Oftentimes, it covers your ability to notify the impacted customers. So like, oh, now you have a million dollars. Okay, you can do a bunch of mailings that go out to everybody whose data was breached. You can follow up. You can pay for some basic logistics. But but, but you know, all of you are right. It's like, yeah, these smaller policies especially don't really actually do much. It's not going to help you actually recover and repair. It might have, help you with some really, really basic breach notification and occasionally maybe No, it won't even help you with that. I, I can illustrate I can it best what no. cyber insurance is like. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm going to go against you, Flea, and say no, because cyber insurance carriers take the stand of, we are not getting you new technology. We're not making you more secure. We are only bringing you back to where you were prior to the breach or prior well, to yeah. the uh, hacktivist. Got, uh, you're absolutely uh, right. right. You know, and, and, just, and, and you're right. I'm sorry, if, but I'm, if, I'm sorry. Hold on. If the policy is like large enough, right? If you're covered for enough, but like I said, like a million dollars doesn't go very far at all. But let's yeah, go and, back. And okay, wait. You, I, I you got to keep going. Go, Joe. Go, Joe. Go. Go, Joe. No, I was going to say, you got to keep going. Because so what if I haven't patched in a couple of years? Oops. So yeah. I, I haven't been maintaining my infrastructure. I just negated the policy in the first place. And you've been it, lying. It, it, is, it is interesting. Some of the various providers are, are getting a lot more diligent and they do deeper dives into what your infrastructure looks like, what your processes are. They actually have people like you and I on their staff that go through and look through the policies. And it, it looks it looks and feels like you're actually going through an audit, but not all providers are the same. And some of the underwriters are exactly right. It's like, oh, hey, you, you bought a firewall, you put it on the shelf. That's good enough for them. Um, well, there's some an even of the bigger others, problem. though, are taken a little bit more seriously. Yeah, there's an even bigger problem going on here. And recently, uh, uh, the White House tried to have meetings with cyber insurance companies uh, to say, you need to be driving compliance. So the bigger problem here is now we're going to have, like, if this goes through, we're going to have cyber insurance companies dictating how security is done. Is that something as a industry that we actually want to happen? Or can we take the yes. proactive approach and get out? And I would say no. Uh, but are they no, doing that no. because they think insurance is going to move faster than regulatory, which I completely agree with you. We see this happening, me, but it's because they think they'll question. move faster. Let me ask a question. Mr. Jeff, um, yes. do you believe that PCI is a good idea? <laughs> I, yes. <laughs> It's a good well, idea. This guy doesn't solve all the problems, unfortunately. No, it doesn't. You know, However, it's, it's, it is an area it's, it's in which an external industry. company is dictating what security you have in your company. Same idea. Yes and no. No, uh, it's not. But, but that's a different discussion. Uh, you know, it's I've a totally framework. gotten us sideways. I'm sorry. It's a framework. <laughs> but so I, I, I want to bring it back to Joe and, sh and shift gears a little bit and, and ask this question. Because, I mean, we, we're, we're going off on a million tangents. <laughs> which is fun, but <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you if, if you see any correlation between uh, organizations, companies, clients, if you will, that are, are, you know, miserably failing at what we consider the basics and miserably failing in other where areas of proprietary, uh, I'm sorry, propriety, and and morality and and whatever you want to call it, where people might get spun up from an hacktivistic perspective. I'm gonna keep coming up with different forms of that word. Um, I like do it. You, you know, is there a correlation between companies that suck at one area of things and they suck at doing the right thing, which is why they spin up people in the first place to, you know, take a stand? Oh yeah, I mean, from. I yeah. I mean, I would definitely say we see security or, or tech resources that have either gone native or will just just call them going dark. I mean, because they have seen so much, either they've had such a significant lack of support, the organization just doesn't believe in what they're doing. They are morally flexible. Uh, they definitely don't put any value on the department. We've seen either their skills decline, their morale decline, clearly their commitment to the organization. But if it's something that they've been there for years and years, they're, they're you know, institutional employees, absolutely we've seen them start to turn. And they're definitely not thinking with the best interests of the company. They're not, they definitely don't have their cyber hats on. They're not acting not only in the best interest, but just general hygiene for security. They just start to lose they lose those skills and they're really not invested in it. So yeah, I, that that person starts to turn into way more of a threat because they're just acting like the organization. If the company doesn't care, why should I? So instead of them becoming better and thinking I'll leave, they just turn. I mean, we've absolutely seen them turning darker and we've talked to the organization. I mean, I think for us, that's where we decide, is this a company we want to do business with? Like we're trying to help them, but they don't want to help themselves. So maybe this is something we need to stop engaging in. I mean, we've absolutely seen that. So what yeah. I hear you saying is if you want to prevent uh, your company becoming victim of some hacktivist activity by an employee, you need to be PCI compliant. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> You got to 
bring it back to PCI. <laughs> I, I, I don't, but I do. Well, but, uh, but, how long is it going to a... take? How long is it going to take cyber insurance companies to start carrying cyber insurance for hacktivism or activism against a business? I, I, that is a really good question. I mean, I think the fact that even we as practitioners on any end of the security spectrum have to debate about, well, who is the hacktivist, who is really, you know, just an agent for change. I mean, where does that fall or where does that line lie? I don't know how many actuaries it's going to take from an insurance standpoint to come up with exactly what specific statistical anomaly it is to all of a sudden bring that into an insurance, you know, an insurance claim. So I don't know. It's, well, it is a really I, good conversation. I, I, I might regret saying this, but put your accounting hat on for a minute. I mean, <laughs> the bottom line to all this is that it's a financial thing. And, you know, the companies are doing or not doing because of at least the perception of it, it costs more, it saves the money. Uh, you know, somebody said on the discord, you know, don't forget security is expensive. And, and the things that the activities that a hacktivist might often do are going to, you know, uh, you know, the motivation, even a lot of activism is to, you know, just think of the, you know, the old fashioned things like boycotts and stuff like that. Uh, you know, are designed to try to hit companies where on the bottom line, you know, to try to impact their, their revenue. So, you know, it's all a financial thing, uh, uh, you know, right? Because you're yeah, an I mean, pay, like, yeah, pay, pay me now, pay me four times that I can help you fix it later. I mean, these are all things that begin with basic hygiene. I mean, there's, there's your anomaly. There's nothing we can stop. This was, you know, there, that threat actor is moving way faster than we are. They, they have absolute intent. We're trying to run a business. So these things are going to happen, but we have to put in all the predictive, all the blocking and tackling, the basic security, general hygiene, the focus on culture and people, people, the, the people and processes, you know, for you not to have that, you're absolutely opening yourself up to financial, reputational, but you know, from just a revenue standpoint, again, how much does it cost to do this block? I mean, just the table stakes to focus on protecting the assets of your organization, protect the revenue stream. The cost of not doing that is so, so much exponentially higher. I don't understand the logic between, well, it's really expensive for me to deploy different security tools and I just don't have the people to put in policy. That's that's so that argument just it, to me is so foreign because we've seen time after time every organization that had a breach, the expense of going to clean that up afterwards is so much more than if they would have just done it right in the first place. That is my soapbox they, for the day. But they do. Yeah. They, they, but they made the the risk based decision. Well, it'll never happen to us, and they hold their breath and cross their fingers and hope it doesn't happen. Um, yeah, and it's not no, but that and we've all seen this. It's not oh if it happens. It's not even it, it's not even when. It's how frequently this is happening all the time every day. It is happening to them. It's just what's the impact, and it'll continue to grow because if we're making money off you now, I'm going to keep doing it and try to make more money off of you. I mean, that's right. what they do. So. Yeah, it, this this will continue to happen, and it's not an issue until it's an issue, and then it's a real big freaking issue. Drops Mike. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a drink. Like, yep, yeah, we're done. We're out of here. Let's go. Boom. <laughs> oh. So, what I'm hearing is, uh, you know. Secure your environment, do the right things by your by your company from a security, dare I say, compliance perspective, and that'll, uh, I'm kind of serious, that'll start, a get, start getting you down the road of maybe your employees are happier with what you're doing because probably necessarily making sound security decisions about your business means you're not blatantly greedy and just always worried about the bottom line. I mean, is it as intangible as that? Or are there any other practical things besides what you've already mentioned about identity and access management that companies can be doing to try to uh, proactively uh, protect themselves against this type of activity, regardless of whether we think it's good or bad? <laughs> well, first, PCI. Yay. <laughs> she said it and i wasn't ready damn it yeah. <laughs> <Ding>. <laughs> i 
All right. So after after we were PCI compliant, no, I mean, I think having a transparent conversation as an organization, you know, through that hiring process, and I know it, it might sound ludicrous, but really just talking during the hiring process about what it is that you do. I mean, what do we care about? What do we do as an organization? Where do we invest our money? How do we really, how does culture play into this? You at least start out with the right alignment with people. And that's overall, it doesn't matter what position they're in because anybody between, you know, secretary to, you know, some, to the CISO, to, every, to the CEO, everybody has an opportunity to be that insider threat. So are we having that same transparent conversation about what, what we're about, how we do business, you know, making sure that you've got that protective layer, not just from compliance, which is critical. You've got to have the baseline compliance in there. But now what is the security, the technology around it so that I can protect those assets? So that I can monitor who has access to what. So I can look when there's when there's an issue, when I see an anomaly, there's actually analytics to to back it up so that I, I can see where the issue lies and how I can immediately go remediate it. So I think the marriage of all those things and that dialogue, the transparency that really hadn't been there before. It was, I mean, you can bring it down to salaries. People don't talk about those things or they used to not. Now everybody talks about everything. So making sure that there is that dialogue, I think that eliminates a huge amount of risk. And it's just not something that is occurring in some organizations and absolutely should, because those things immediately will trigger action and, and the motivation, like you were talking about, the motivation to do way more bad than good. Well, gentlemen, any other questions? <laughs> any topic? We've, been, we've covered multiple ground here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. There's so much to think about. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> hey, you made thanks. our brains hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's say, a job. We just want to take it out from here and not go any deeper into anything else because this has been a great show. We could yeah, do that. Really? We could can have Joe say. P we can certainly bring her back, and 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 she can say PCI anytime. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to come back, drop a mic, and say PCI all day long. <laughs> yeah. I was waiting for that. And then By I can the wear my Star Wars shirt next time. Oh, By the way, yeah. people on yeah. Discord have been loving that. the things behind you, uh, the things on your bookcase. They are awesome. Yeah. And in, they're, 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 we, we actually transcribed them on Discord, you know, just, just to be clear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is hey, funny because I did, I did the same thing on the prep call. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> your, your, your slogan's on the back. Well, um, well, there's Joe, one that you can't see. This ain't my first rodeo because I do love a good PCI conversation. So that's one behind me that you can't see somewhere. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you. Well, Joe, uh, yeah. Any, any, uh, any final thoughts for us? Any final encouragements? Uh, I'll let you have the last word. No, so it has been a pleasure. So many different topics. So I am. Um, I just love the conversation. I'm happy and honored to be here with you guys and we got to do it again. More to cover. Sounds good. Yeah, we're yeah, as is usually the case, we only scratch the surface and it's almost like we need to have Joe back for like a greatest hits. She can comment on the topics we've had over the last 6 months because I think she has an opinion on just about everything. That, that's oh. it's helpful and 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 takes us even deeper. Um so thank you, Joe, for joining us today. Very much appreciate it uh, and appreciate the, the conversation that you brought forth here. Uh, it's going to wrap us this week. Uh, tune in next week. Give you a little bit of a teaser. Next week, we're talking to Casey Ellis, the founder, chairman, and CTO of a little company called Bug Crowd. Uh, we're probably going to talk PCI again, but it's going to be in the context of uh, not only bug bounties, but penetration testing, my other favorite topic. So uh, be sure to join us. Don't miss it. And until then, stay secure, stay compliant, keep your employees happy, and uh, encourage your, your bosses to spend money in the right way. We're out.